Welcome to Don't Fear the Weight podcast with your host Vicky Masita, bringing together science and personal experience. Hi guys, welcome to the next episode of Don't Fear the Weight podcast. I am usual, I'm your teeny tiny host, the tiny titan Vicky Masita. I never ever change, I never grow, I probably just shrink. Um, which you probably have seen throughout the weeks. I've just got leaner and leaner and leaner getting ready for my stage appearance. But anyway, enough about me. Um, This podcast I'm really excited about. We've actually got a bit of a trio going on. See how I chose that word very, very well? Trio, not threesome. I'm glad that you picked up on that one. So today I have got VJ and Scott, and I am extremely excited to introduce them to you. So, hey guys, how are you? Hello, hello. Thanks for having us. Hey. <laughs> no worries. How are you doing, guys? Is everything going okay? Really good, really good. How about yourself? Oh, well, you know, I'm just kind of ticking along, can't grumble. That's the way that we should be, right? Right on. Well, thanks for having us. We really appreciate it. VJ, this is our first uh, appearance visually in podcasting, isn't it? Yeah, I feel sorry for everybody watching right now. This, this could potentially be... This could potentially be you know, your, 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 most, uh, your least downloaded show here now, VJ. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I don't think so. As long as you share it correctly at the right time, everybody will see it. Be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so guys, just introduce yourself to everybody who basically has been living under a rock and they don't know who you are. Scott, you first. Go for it. Uh, I'm Scott McNally. I'm part of uh, half of Bodybuilding Nerds, Bodybuilding Nerds Radio, and uh, I feel weird having you stare at me, VJ. We we do <laughs> podcasting every week. We talk at least uh, for you know, two hours a week on our show, but I'm not used to looking at you. So this is uh, this is very different. It's gonna take some getting used to. Um, you know, I also uh, am part of uh, the Advices Radio Network. We put out uh, several podcasts a week, you know, all bodybuilding related. Um, VJ is also a part of that over there. So, uh, you know, we, we just do a lot of podcasting. Um, I'm also a diet coach. I work specifically, you know, with uh, athletes, most of them that are competing, but a lot of non-competitors as well. That's my full-time thing, and uh, podcasting is my full-time thing. So my goal is just to try to uh, help share good information. And and um, Vicky, like we were talking before, I want to put out the material that I would want to hear. So that's that's kind of what I'm trying to do every week. And hopefully, we are entertaining and educating people, and people are able to make a little bit better progress. Than they than they may have otherwise. Plus, stay safe. That's that's a big key element too. Yeah, that's a big fundamental, isn't it? That's one of the reasons why, like we were talking about previously, why I started this podcast because I am so annoyed and sick and tired that we've got no kind of studies on female bodybuilding. You know yeah. that, that there's a lot going on about female um, bikini competitors and things like that, but there's nothing about you know muscle building women and. And I really want to kind of bring that into the open again in a safe manner. So I'm really, really pleased that we've got you on here as well during that. Oh, well, thank you. So, VJ, over to you, hon. Uh, I'm, I'm one half of Bible News Radio. We started this thing uh, two years ago, actually more than two years ago now. Yeah. And um, uh, I'm part of the Advices Radio Network, too. Uh, we're just like, uh, we're just two amateur bodybuilders who aren't very good. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, we both come from different backgrounds, different paths, you know, as far as bodybuilding goes. Um, as it turns out, we're, we both ended up being, you know, bodybuilding coaches, got diet coaches. Um, I went to Palmer College of Chiropractic. I graduated uh, as a doctor of chiropractic. I only practiced for about six years, though, and uh, I sold my business and pretty much got into a different business altogether. But the entire time, you know, the entire time it was always geared towards bodybuilding. Even when I was in school, I was just like, in digestion nutrition classes or anatomy physiology classes, you know, everything was like, oh, right. So biomechanically, if I do a curl, I'm activating this muscle, this muscle, you know, I'm eating the protein, it's, it's doing this chemical composition in my body. That's so it all helped out. It all worked out for me um, for as far as bodybuilding coaches go. And, and uh, I've, I've had a good run so far, you know, as far as the coach, coach goes. So, uh, as far as bodybuilding goes, I competed naturally for about 10 years. Okay. And uh, and then uh, fr- from there, I just I decided to just hang it up. Uh, I never turned pro as a as a natty, um, and so I, I just uh, plus I got married. And after you get married, it's like uh, it, it becomes more important, you know, to, than, than bodybuilding does. Well, competing, anyways. 
yeah definitely I agree well I'm married and I'm still competing but to be perfectly honest he just does as he told so it's all right hey <laughs> we're still happy we're still happy it's all good okay cool so um have you got any competitors on the box at the moment obviously you're coaching so have you have you got any guys competing these weekends coming up uh, not this I, you got Scott I have I have one guy who's going to be competing in Los Angeles and then a few people coming up there you know always always somebody you know who, who's going to be coming up this is the competitive season so you know every, every week or two there's i've got a couple people go, coming up fantastic yeah. what about you i have a few that are coming up not not anytime in the next few weeks but it looks like more like september october nice. um yeah that's like it's kind of like we're getting to like a lull in the season you know where it'll kind of pick back up around the fall seems like but uh, right. yeah but a lot of my clients are also just a uh, lifestyle Oh, okay. So you do, I yeah. see you do with general population clients as well. Right. Yeah. I would say about 50% of them are just lifestyle. They, they, they don't have any intentions on competing, but mm -hmm. if you do, I uh, can help them out with that too, you know, but it's, it's more important that they just find this path and learn this lifestyle, live this lifestyle and then progress from there, you know? Yeah, absolutely. See, I find that really interesting because a lot of, um, quote unquote, bodybuilding coaches, um, and diet coaches and things only deal with prep clients do you know what i mean whereas you've got a mixture of the two so it's quite nice to see that balance really yeah yeah it's, it's rewarding actually i i find it actually more rewarding that and I, it's funny though that a lot of the uh, a lot of the non-competitors are a lot more grateful and thankful to you too you know it's like you know i mean not that i need that you know or anything but it, it is it's nice to hear it and they are very grateful that you know they're they're seeing their abs or you know yeah. they're changing life or it's it, it's it's a good feeling that's yeah. it that's it well you see if you've got a competitor and they lose well they yeah. blame you don't they oh, it's, it's all the coach's fault are you kidding yeah of course <laughs> uh, so you didn't give them enough tilapia to you know thin, thin the skin right yeah yeah it didn't yeah. work for me either, so <laughs> okay so uh now that that nice little chit chat out of the way let's get into the subject that we really wanted to talk about um so basically i am a natural competitor and um I have been competing naturally for the last four years, and we just want to start I'm being buzzed by a fly there. I'm not just kind of, you know, doing this here. Um, so what we really wanted to get into was patience in this industry, because one of the things that I have personally found is that people in the natural industry, when they start out, um, are very, very quick to kind of go, right, well, I've been lifting for like four months, and now I just want to take a load of gear. Cool. I wanted your guys' opinion on it because, Vijay, obviously you've competed naturally for 10 years and then made the transition over. Um, and it was more about your experience of what made you decide was the right time to kind of hang it up naturally and then go and find a different avenue and that kind of thing. And then, Scott, I know you have some different views as well. So this, this, I'm excited about having this conversation. So, Scott, why don't you start about your views about the patients in the industry? Um, I think Vijay's got a, a much more interesting story, a, a more interesting story that I think a lot of people will will find to be more acceptable than mine. Um, you know, I uh, I started training early on. I found bodybuilding with with uh, my my family. My parents were both into it, and oh. so I was around people that were lifting seriously from the time that I was just a small child and could walk into the gym. Um, I started training naturally. Can't even remember when you know 12 11 years old and wow. uh, i got kind of serious with it around 14 years old and i i trained very seriously for a year but then my life took a different path and i i totally stopped training altogether um later in life around like 19 years old i did the same thing and i trained for like three years straight three years solid and i i stayed natural at that time I went through a long phase of not training then and when i came back to it and i decided that i was going to make uh, make it part of my life and stay consistent with it. At this point, I was in my late twenties, and it, it wasn't long after I got back into it that I decided to start using gear. So, right. I mean, I I pretty much went from, you know, being a hundred and fifty pounds to then deciding that okay, this is what I'm going to decide to do. I'm going on thirty years old. I don't have a ton of time left here. I'm going to make the most of this. Um, at the same time my foundations were already solid with nutrition and training and I already understood those things. So I kind of hesitate to really even tell that part of my story publicly. And I don't think I really have so much because I don't want to give the wrong impression to people that are newer. 
Um, you know, I, ideally, I would have stayed continuing to train natural. But I think at the same time, for a longer period of time, I think at the same time, there are a lot of people that, that kind of push it too far. They're like, you should tap out your genetic limits. Well, realistically, okay, so let's say you start training, you know, in high school, and you start to get good by the time you're 19, 20 years old. Okay, and then you keep training naturally. Now, what are your genetic limits? Let's say you push until you're 25 is that time some people would say well no you could still go further so what you're going to wait until you're 30 years old to start gear and then realistically i mean at that point you you know you're, you're pretty much you don't you're running out of time you know is really yeah. what it comes down to so so i think what it really comes down to at the end of the day is making sure that um you know you have a solid foundation making sure that you you are able to make progress and um and realistically, yeah, you should get a couple of years under your belt. And that's not what I did when I got back into training again and I took it seriously and, and I stuck with it. I mean, I've been training now again for um, over a decade and, and using gear for most of that time. Um, I've kept the doses moderate. I, I've never gone really crazy with anything. And I've always maintained that the nutrition and the training is the foundation of, of what I need to do. So... Like I said, I know VJ, your story is a lot different than mine, and and you did, I think, the things that everybody would want to say, you know, that they should do. You you trained for an extended period of time without using gear. You took it as far as you possibly could, and you didn't even begin anything until, you know, until you absolutely needed to. So I'll, I'll turn it over to you to tell your story because I feel like like this is the story of of the champion that did the right thing. All <laughs> <laughs> about that, but um. But yeah, it's definitely a little more opposite than what, what you know, Scott's experience was. Um, I, I started training at the age of about 16 when my parents allowed me to start training. Apparently, right. they, thought, they thought, oh, it's going to stunt your growth. You, you're not allowed to start training until you're 16. Little did they know, I'm still pretty short. So <laughs> I, I second that. I second that. <laughs> so, so I started training about 16, and um, it was for football. And as things progressed, you know, my body started to respond pretty quickly. Uh, and I realized, man, you know, training is way more fun than getting hit by other people or, or putting hits on other people in football. Uh, American football, by the way. Sure, it's, yeah. sure. So that's like our rugby. But yeah. Well, yeah. Like more or less. Right. Yeah. And so, um, and so I just kind of made the transition, you know, after high school was done, it was uh, all about bodybuilding. And uh, so between 16 and 19, I completely you know changed my physique changed my body and i decided it was it was good good time to start competing as a 19 year old just as a teen mm. unfortunately back then uh it was 98 and there was no teen divisions uh, where when I, when I was competing so i was it was a uh, novice or open so i try i chose the, the novice and uh um i ended up doing pretty well you know i didn't um i didn't feel a need for any gear at, even even at that but i i, I have to put a disclaimer out there uh, I had blood work done when I was 21, uh, just to test hormones. I forgot what I why why I was testing hormones out, but um, I was uh, I was on like a high, like the the highest range of natural testosterone output that like a human can have, like a male can have, it was like almost 1,200 nanograms per deciliter. Wow. I, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with that range. I know the range is different between UK and, and like American and North American standards. No, the ranges kind of stay the same. Um, the only reason why I know that is because I'm a registered adult nurse, so I need to know those ranges as well. So they do kind of stay relatively the same over across the borders. Right on. So yeah, you know all about it. So um, I, I and I didn't know that when I started training. That was probably why I responded so 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 well to training and diet right away. Um, so I just didn't feel I needed the help. You know, I was like, I'm doing this naturally and then things are coming, coming on good. You know, my chest is growing, my arms are growing, my legs are growing, everything's doing great, you know? So I just stayed on that path, competed in the, uh, in, in, as a natural in the NPC, in the NANBF. Uh, I competed, uh, in muscle mania also and all these uh, natural divisions and things, natural organizations. I did pretty well. You know, I never got lower than fourth place. So that, that's pretty good, but yeah. I never, I never won an overall either. So that sucks. But, um, <laughs> But you came close to turning pro, correct? I did. I did on three separate occasions. I, it, was, it would have been four separate occasions, but apparently that one was not a pro qualifier. <laughs> so, uh, but I, and I didn't find that out until I was registering, you know, that day. And they were like, oh, yeah, this is not a pro qualifier. I was like, you sons of bitches. But <laughs> I did it anyway, so it doesn't matter. 
So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, I came pretty close and, um, uh, you know, that went on until about 2010. So between 98 and 2010, um, and right around 2010, uh, I started noticing some changes in my body that I wasn't real happy with. I noticed some, uh, even some like light depression, you know, I just figured, oh, fuck, I'm th turning 30, you know, probably this, this, will, this is what happens, right? So I go in and get blood work done uh, just to see where my hormones are at and my testosterone actually crashed um, uh, about roughly half of what, a, what my natural, you know, output was. Okay. So, um, so that, that's what kind of led me to start looking at hormone replacement at that point. I was only 30, which is, it's odd, you know, it, it is weird, but, and that's a significant drop from 1200 nanograms per deciliter to like right, you know, sub, sub, sub 700 nanograms per deciliter. You know, that's, that's technically, that's pretty normal and pretty, pretty good for, for, for a male. Yeah. But for me, I was, I was used to this, you know, higher standard and uh, this natural output that was very high. And, uh, and, uh, and I was feeling it, you know what I mean? When that testosterone gets cut in half, you start to feel it. And, um, and so it's I started. like you peaked too early, wasn't it? Yeah, right, yeah, yeah. And, and so it just started, and, and you know, like I said, for, for an average 30-year-old guy, 700 nanograms for death leader is pretty good. You know, yeah. that, that's a nice range for, for most guys. I, I tell my clients that are, that are natty and guys that are on TRT that, you know, 700, 800 range is, is very comfortable. But for me, it wasn't comfortable because that's half of my natural output. Yeah. So um, it was at that point that I decided that I need to do something about it or it's just going to decline from there. Um, I actually went on, 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 uh, on HCG first. That was okay. like my initial plan that my doctor had me actually go on, uh, HCG and some CERNs. And that, was, that actually helped out a lot for about eight months and then nothing. And then it just tanked again. So I don't know if my late cells get kind of just, you know, adapted to that or, or, or what, but I just think long-term HCG is not, is not the best idea um, for, for someone who's, who's got a lower, you know, lower output of testosterone. So that was the next stage. The next stage after that was just be like, well, I got to make a life decision here. And I think that's going to be it. It's not, I'm not going to stop bodybuilding. That's for damn sure. So I guess I'm going to, you know, make the, uh, make the transition to the dark side, right? To the dark uh, side. <laughs> right. So that, that's what I did, and uh, things have been great. Uh, I have not competed since 2010, and I don't actually plan to. Uh, I just, you know, living the lifestyle is far more important to me now, and teaching it to clients, that's a lot more important to me now. And I can, I can live vicariously through some of my clients too, you know. It's like just I don't know, a few weekends ago, I had, uh, I had a couple of, uh, of my clients turn pro, and I was just like, yes! That's you awesome. Know? I did do it myself, but man, I, I definitely <laughs> went down the path and helped them out. You know, Scott also got his first pro turn, by the way, so uh, a couple of weeks ago. So that was pretty cool too. But, um, but yeah, so that, that that's that's kind of my story. Uh, you know, I, I did the best I could as a natty, and then uh, made the transition. So okay, okay. so in regards to. Uh, making that transition now I hear a lot of stories now don't get me wrong yeah I am not clued upon gear whatsoever I know um, principles of how people use them and I've seen people use them in a, in a bad way because they just kind of load up on absolutely everything um, and I've seen people obviously use quite a lot um, when they're coming into a cut to drop, just drop all of that weight and lots of thyroid messing around and things like that how did you um or how did you go about finding the right doses for you at the right time when you wanted to transition and the same question goes to you scott as well because obviously you were older when you started it um so how did you know or how did you figure out the right dosages the right drugs at the right time so you didn't kind of mess yourself up you know what i want to I want to add something too to what you were saying, VJ. You know, I had had um, pseudo gynecomastia, you know, with, uh, gyno without lumps, basically, naturally as a teen. And um, I still felt like I had like additional fat in my chest growing up that never had gone away. So in my late 20s, when I started bodybuilding, I discovered what gyno was. And I went and got a consultation about this. And part of that was getting my lab work done. And this was before I began using gear. And I was in like the low 400s on, on test. So it, it, and you know what, too? I feel like I had, um, I had suffered for a, a lot of depression on and off through my life. And since I began using gear and, you know, on HRT between cycles, I've never experienced any of those feelings again. It's something I think, VJ, 
maybe that's what's so different between you and I is that you had such high testosterone all through your life where I think that my testosterone was pretty low, you know. I pretty wonder if your estrogen was a little bit higher too, you know. With you that know I was just about to ask that, yeah. Do yeah. you know what your estrogen levels were? Yeah, I don't, you know what, I don't remember now what, what the readings were. And this was, this was over a decade ago. I'd probably have a hard time finding that lab work. I don't even know if she tested estrogen, but she did test testosterone. And, um, and I know that, you know, like I said, it was in the low 400 range, which, which is, you know, pretty low for a guy that's, I think, I think I was 27 or 28 at the time. Yeah. But uh, nonetheless, my experience came um, from from reading the boards first. So I, I basically, you know, I went to the message boards and that's where I first learned. Um, and, and then I found a guy in my local area that coached and, and he helped me out um, with a lot of my early cycling, especially for competition. And, and I learned a lot of things that you, that you just can't pick up on the Internet. Um, but a lot of my early knowledge came from from reading the message boards and and then going from there. So I just understood, you know, in a lot of the, the, the places that I researched to were in the UK. I found that the UK message boards at the time, at least, were a lot more moderate than the US boards. The people I, were I, using a lot more you know, low doses of gear. Everything was was about doing, you know, your PCT, about taking your time off, about staying healthy um, versus I would say that on the U.S. boards at the time, everybody seemed to be running at least like 250 milligrams more test at least. Um, wow. So, yeah, I mean, I, I just I basically took what had what I had been told would generally work for people, and I went from there. And and I have found too that there is kind of a general a general starting dose for cycling at least. I feel like if you're going to be on an HRT program, if you're using testosterone for replacement purposes, I feel like then the balance is a lot more specific to make sure you're at the level that you feel normal and you feel comfortable at. I think as far as raising testosterone levels, that there's maybe it doesn't have to be quite as specific if that makes sense in order yeah, yeah. to get a good effect and um in, in order to still be able to uh to control side effects so right, right. Okay, okay. so how about how about um i actually got the uh i when when my doctor she wanted to keep doing you know like natural stuff but some hcg and then and she wanted to pull me off hcg and, and retest in a few miles like no nah, i don't we're not going to do that so what i did was i actually uh flew to tampa <laughs> and uh got a prescription out of a clinic in uh in the, the tampa bay area in florida and um they had suggested they wanted to start me off on 300 milligrams of testosterone that's that's i mean that's a pretty pretty hefty dose um Especially when I was considering, you know, I just I just want to start with like 200, you know, 200 milligrams uh, and go from there. But, you know, they, they prescribed 300. I said, OK, let's fine. Let's do it. And uh, I hated it within, yeah. within, within like a week and a half. I, I just hated it. I was like a bloated mess. I felt like shit, you know, and it was just it was just too much. It was too much for me. Um, uh, I uh, at the time it was it was like a, just a brand new feeling altogether. And it did. I'm a, as it turned out, I'm like a hyper, hyper converter. Like I'm, I'm, I'm an aromatase water bag, you know? <laughs> so it's just, you know, that dosage, just all it did was puff me up real bad and, uh, you know, sorry, give me really bad estrogen side effects. Yeah. So, so I, I asked him about, I asked the doctor at the time and, and he's like, all right, just drop it down to 200. That's exactly what I did. So I dropped it down to 200 manage my estrogen it took a lot of a lot of play to be honest with you it wasn't like a real smooth transition trying to figure out the right dosages for me it just overall <laughs> health you know um so it took it took another probably eight eight to eight months to another year or so to figure out you know the proper dosages between the testosterone the aromatase inhibitor and then my thyroid started <laughs> become an issue too so there was thyroid meds involved also which even to this day, I'm on thyroid medication, uh, a blend of T4, T3. Um, right. But yeah, so it, it took a while to, to figure that out for myself. And um, I don't know, it, it's, uh, it, it's better now, you know, yeah, but that's sure. seven years later, you know, that's a lot of research to go. It certainly is. And were you ever kind of apprehensive about starting any of these apart from the, um, the big dose of test at the beginning? Um, you know, like Scott, yeah, I, all my research was, and, and this is, this is all that we had available to us was, was research from the boards and anecdotal experience. You know, there was not a lot, a lot of papers out there that you could read, I mean, nothing in medicine that you can read, you know, yeah. 
so it, it was it was a matter of of just getting your blood work done every six six to eight weeks and trying to figure out you know if that number is good for you if you're feeling good on that uh, and, and in addition if your estrogen is too high does that need to come down you know is a lot of balancing that 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 they took so but uh, but yeah it's um, it worked out you know yeah that's good so just moving over then in regard and so obviously those are your experiences when you coach somebody um, and I take it that you coach naturals as well as assisted both of you or are they just assisted yeah, you oh yeah all, all walks yeah yep. all, all walks so if um, say, say like you've got a young guy who is 19 years old and I'm, I'm just interested in the differences of opinion um, and they've been training since they were 16 and at 19 they said right I want to go and do a show and I want to get massive so I've got two years um, what drugs can I take would you be quite happy to just kind of give them a first preliminary cycle or would you discuss things a little bit more with them and what kind of approach would you take personally? You know, it's a, it's a personal uh, decision and uh, uh, it's like 50-50. Half the time, if someone says that to you, uh, they're either going to, you know, you're, you're going to give your own opinion on what they should do. You know, I would, I would give my own opinion. I, honestly, I'd tell them, uh, listen, is this something you really want to do? This is, this is a life-changing decision you know you re repercussions are are that you know you could potentially never recover might have issues with having kids if that's part of your life that you want you know um, so you got you got to tell them all the all the positive all the negatives um, and and just make them kind of weigh out their choice a little better um, I personally I would I would tell them you know you know if this is what you want to do you know why not? Why not just wait a bit and see how you just respond to proper diet and proper training? Most of the time, these guys that ask those questions have just their diet is shit and their yeah. training is even worse. You know, so uh, just the tweaks in the diet and the training, they can grow. You know, they can do really well. Now, if they're saying, "Oh, I want to put on some hundred hundred pounds or something," I'm not going to answer that question. I'm just be like, "You're nuts. Get out of here." Yeah. You know, <laughs> go to the next coach. You know, I'm not going to help you do that. It sounds like. Terrible, you know, uh, and, and probably not even realistic. You know, a lot of these guys are if they're asking those questions. Number one, they're, they're too young; they don't know enough about just bodybuilding altogether. They don't understand their own genetics. They don't understand genetic potential. Mm. You know, so I mean, they just have a lot more research to do, just in general, not just drugs. You know, mm. so yeah, I don't know. I would uh, if someone came to me and, and told me that, I would turn them away. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, what about you? Um, well, I can give you I can give you some examples. I, I can think of one guy that I'm working with right now that when he came to me, and I believe I believe he's about 24, um, so he's definitely old enough in my opinion to to start using gear if he wanted to, but his experience level was really low, and he was holding a good deal of body fat when he came to me, and his goal was to get big, and he wanted to be big and lean. Everybody who doesn't know you know a lot about what they're getting into they say that they want to do two things and that's that they want to get big and that they want to get ripped and they want to make that happen at the same time basically yeah, yeah right um, and it is like you're saying vj it's kind of you know some unrealistic expectations um you know and his thought was he thought you know should i use steroids and he said i'm totally open to it if you think this would be a good thing for me you know let's do it and let's start it now because i just want to do whatever it takes he's, he's like that and um and i my suggestion to him was to to listen to a couple of podcasts in particular that really broke down the 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 ins and outs of of um going from being natural to starting gear and the side effects that you need to be ready for the effects that you need to be ready for um and like you were saying vj the potential long-term percussions that can come from it so i've always suggested to people like this guy that please you know listen to this one hour podcast first and you know read these articles first and let's think about it and and while we're at it you know i i always try to impress upon them the importance of the nutrition program that you know you can take as much gear as you want and if you don't have the diet right you know then then they're not going to be able to make the progress they want and we could look at his physique and say okay so based off of how he's looking now you know the guy was holding a decent amount of body fat his diet isn't isn't dialed in so i said let's focus on that first let's let's start getting that body fat in order and then from there you know continue doing your research and let's just keep this dialogue open and now fast forward about it's been about 
eight months since we started working together. We dieted him down. We got all the fat off of him. And um, he's he's in an off-season plan now. And he decided to start Osterine. And he's taking 20 milligrams of Osterine. And he's doing that for four weeks on and, you know, several weeks off. Um, and, and, and it's giving him a better idea of what he might be getting himself into. Um, I, I think that that was a good move for this guy in particular. I think that every story is, is completely, you know, individual. No, yeah, I can, sure. I could see there being maybe potentially some 19 year old out there and it's probably very rare, but maybe there is a situation where it's like, this guy's ready. I, I don't know though. I I've never met that kid. I've never met a 19 year old and said, you should start steroids now. Yeah. I just have, you know, I haven't. Um, but I do have a lot of people that are on the fence and considering it. And I do work with a lot of natural guys. I, and I've worked with natural guys who've competed naturally for several years and, and now are starting to transition into using gear. Um, and I'm glad that I can be there as a coach to help people with this. If, if somebody came to me and that they said, I'm going to do this, whether you help me or not, then I would rather be there to help them than, than just let them mess themselves up. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, yeah. I'm not going to necessarily advocate that somebody starts gear. I've never told anybody ever that you should do this. You know, I've never told a natural guy like, man, you should really hop on steroids. Um, yeah. Like Vijay had said, I believe that it's always the individual's choice. Um, but I do want to be there to help support people and to keep them as safe as possible, whether they're my clients or not. Before I started coaching, I helped so many people for free online just because I've I felt like it's been a duty of mine almost to just help people to stay safe. Yeah, absolutely. And you don't have a lot of those people like yourself out there um, anymore. And it's, it's so refreshing to hear that you are quite open, like all the podcasts and everything that you do, you know, all of that information is out there for free. And I, I urge everybody who's listening to this to go and listen to those podcasts, even if you're not considering, you know, using um, gear or any different kinds of performance enhancing drugs, because I mean, I, I don't, but I listen to all of the podcasts because it's all about education. So when you do get to that fence, and that potential, I've reached my genetic limit, but I still want to go a little bit further. At least you're going to have some kind of basis of knowledge instead of just kind of hopping on the biggest amount that you can find and then potentially, obviously, mess yourself up. Sure. Yeah. Um, one thing I did want to get into is um, the differences that you found training and um, having a nutrition plan or eating, I suppose, and absorbing all of those nutrients going from natural to assisted did you find a massive difference between the two or was it fairly consistent you still trained the same way as you did as a natural but you just went heavier and you could go for longer you want to start Vige? uh yeah sure i'll, I'll go I'll, my my uh my story is going to be probably opposite than scott hmm. so yeah let's uh um it was it's weird uh i find that i found that i actually could not get away with eating as much as I had been as a natty. Oh, really? really? Yeah, and that's just that's just my experience. I don't know if it has if it has to do with um, you know uh, you know the testosterone. Any anabolic is a great food partitioner. So that may have meant that at the time, as as a natty, maybe I wasn't partitioning food as as well as I could have been. There was a lot of waste. Um, you know, uh, I wasn't getting a, I wasn't getting. I wasn't absorbing and assimilating the food like I potentially could have been while on gear. And you do you know, think that could have been down to any kind of uh, gut health or digestive health at all? Or? Absolutely, absolutely, it definitely, definitely could have been. You know, I, I don't know, um, I don't know, the, you know, how this, how the uh, the gear could have changed that, uh, but because I still, I still kind of suffer from not being able to eat too many fats. You know, okay. so, and it might, and it, and it has, it's got to be like an enzymatic type issue where I can't break down fats or I'm just, you know, eliminating them, in, you know, but the fact is if I start eating fats, I actually put on a lot of body fat. So it's, it's very strange. Um, but I will say that, you know, as a, as a natty, I, I was able to eat way more food through a dieting phase versus on gear. Um, I, I, you know, I can get away with eating like literally like a bird, like a 12 year old girl and I will keep my lean mass and, you know, lose that body fat. I'm a lot more hungry as a result and things are not as fun. You know, I can't eat, you know, 250 grams of carb a day anymore, but, um, I can get away with less and, um, and, and, and get there a little bit faster. I found as far as training goes, um, 
training, uh, it's different because, you know, when you're in your 20s, you're, you're fucking Superman or Superwoman, yeah. right? Uh, Especially if you got a testosterone level like you had anyway. Yeah, it was, you know, I was lifting heavy weights, no problem, <laughs> squatting 500 pounds, no problem. I remember walking into a gym when I was 21, 22, 22, my, all my partners had already started training. They already started squatting. I walked in, no warm-ups, 405 on the bar, and, and, and did it, you know, eight times. Just no warm-up. I would not dream of doing something like that now. I would break <laughs> every bone in my body, you know? So yeah. training in their 20s and training in your 30s is very different, uh, especially now I'm 38. So that's, that's, a, that's a big difference. But uh, my joints are telling me so, too. But um, – as far as recovery goes, I can tell you that um, it's definitely you, when you're enhanced, the recovery is, is far better. You can train longer. You can train a little bit harder with the intensity. You know, uh, you can train with more volume too, which is kind of fun. I will say because you know, as bodybuilders, we like to train. You know, and uh, as a natty, I found that I could not, I could not have that kind of volume, not nowhere near this kind of volume, and uh, not start to eat away some lean tissue. You know, kind of just you know, spinning my wheels at that point. Uh, whereas now I can get away with uh, just doing a lot more stuff and uh, recovering a little bit faster. So that that's probably the, the greatest difference that I've seen uh, between Natty and now. Yeah. And did you find with the recovery as well, did you find that you had um, any muscle soreness or is that reduced as well? Um, you know, it's tough to say because the intensity has gone up so much yeah. that, that, that I can't really even gauge between the two. Uh, the soreness is still there, <laughs> you know, if, you know, we're, we're bodybuilders, so we're a little nuts, right? So we feel like if we're not sore the next day, we didn't do jack shit in the gym, right? That's it. So it didn't so, squat low enough. Yeah, right. You didn't, you didn't train hard enough, you know, go back, do it again. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, it's tough to gauge, but I still get, I still get, I make sure I still get pretty sore, you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah that, okay. that hasn't changed. No, that's <laughs> good. Okay. So over to you, Scott, what's your opinion? I think, you know, the training thing specifically, that's something VJ and I have talked a lot about. Um, when he and I first met, because, you know, we're friends in real life, not just on the internet. <laughs> um, not just on Instagram. Right. right, right. Not just on Instagram. <laughs> we, uh, we started training together. And, and my methods for training were, were based off of what has worked for me, enhanced. And, and I've always done, I always had a lot more volume in my programs and my workouts were a lot longer versus VJ had always had that style of, of like he was saying, you know, shorter workouts, get in, get done what needs to get done, hit it hard, hit it heavy, and then get out. Um, and, and it's been interesting to watch VJ's evolution, seeing him come in uh, to being enhanced with that mindset and then seeing how he's transitioned and seeing how some of your workouts have changed and how he has adapted um, over time to, to transition into, into some things that, that may, you know, may work better for somebody that's enhanced. And I, and I do agree, um, that you, you, you almost have, you almost have more, more room when you're enhanced to not yeah. have as perfect of training, you know, yeah. right, okay. you can get in there and you can kind of just throw a bunch of stuff and see what sticks, um, okay. you know, versus I feel like with natural guys, that recovery is so so much more of an important factor because you know if you are overdoing it um and, and and you might have a harder time recovering and that's something i've had to focus on um i train with a lot of my local clients especially on leg day we always get together and there will be a group sometimes there'll be six of us and we will split off into you know three groups of two or two groups of three and just go back to back to back and I, some of my leg workouts have been known to be like three plus hours. And this oh is like, a, yeah, it's like a, it's like a full on workout too. We're not talking like, we're not just standing there talking, you know, there, yeah. there's some long warm ups. So, you know, the first couple exercises, it, it might take a while before we're actually getting into working sets. It might okay. take 45 minutes just to get through that first warm up. But, um, you know, some of that stuff I've had to question, you know, I've got natural guys that are training with me. You know, is this stuff going to be as effective for them as it is for somebody who's enhanced? And, you know, I definitely think that there's a line there. Once again, you know, like we were saying before, um, I think it's real individual. You know, I think that that no matter what, if you're using gear or not, that your ability to recover is going to be individual to you. You know, 
and and I think that gear will enhance everything you know about your program. So so you know if you were a slow recoverer in the past, you might still be a slow recoverer, but it'll probably be faster than you had recovered you know in the past. I I do think that you're still going to get sore. You know you're you're still going to feel it. And if anything, people who are using gear can can usually dig that much deeper and push that much harder lift that much more weight and so i think that maybe they're tearing down a little bit more tissue possibly and this is just a guess you know but you know i i could see that maybe they're tearing down a little bit more tissue and so so that additional recovery benefit it it, it might just kind of balance things out because you know you're, you're pushing that much harder while on gear in my personal life um, I found that I couldn't gain muscle very well at all, no matter how much I ate naturally. And, and I think this goes back to just what my genetics are. You know, before, before lifting, I was 125 pounds at 5'7", which is wow. you know, very slim build. Um, I'd always been very small, very small bone structure. And but very small. Still enormous, enormous calves still. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah, and, I saw that on Facebook the other day and commented, I must say. <laughs> thank you, by the way. Um, but yeah, the, the muscle mass was something that was never really part of my life, no matter how much food I ate. And so, yeah, I think that for me, using gear had allowed me to utilize that much more food. It's it's just allowed me to... to um, to put more muscle on and that's that's not just cycling either but i believe while running hrt which i have for a year at a time uh without cycling gear and i've been able to uh, you know maintain a lot more than i had been able to naturally absolutely right so um just out of curiosity really just um when you were saying that you found it difficult to build muscle mass no matter how much that you were eating did you find that you just accumulated body fat rather than muscle mass then absolutely or, yeah, yeah right okay so it's not like you couldn't put on weight you actually put on scale weight but it was just like the wrong kind of weight that you wanted it, 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 it when i say put on body fat too it wasn't even a lot of body fat i just had a skinny fat body for all right. my life it, it wasn't pretty and it's just it's just the way i i remained you know i I could be skinny fat at 115 pounds at my very lowest or uh, skinny fat at 140 pounds. And it just wasn't very pretty either way. So Right. <laughs> so that might have been the fact that your testosterone was on the lower end and maybe your estrogen was on the higher end. And that's the reason why you did that. It's, it, it's very possible. Absolutely. It's very possible. And, you know, I will mention, too. The only time, you know, to, to back up and talk about um, clients and, and using gear, um, the only times that I've ever suggested somebody does consider something like that is I've seen certain situations where I can look at somebody's body, I can see how they're responding, or maybe I should say not responding, and I'll say to them, you know what, you might wanna to go to the doctor. And usually yeah. if I say that to somebody, I have yet to be wrong. If I can't figure something out, and I keep coming up against the wall, I can't get this female to lose body fat no matter what we do. Um, I can't get this guy to gain muscle no matter what we do. They get lab work done, and then we find out that something was off hormonally. And so far, I haven't been wrong about that. So there, I would say that, yeah, that it definitely kind of backing up here, like I said. But I think that that would be a good situation where I would actually suggest to somebody, hey, if you want to gain muscle, this is something you should highly consider after you talk to your doctor and you go through those proper channels. Definitely. Okay, awesome. Now let's just move over to the light side a little bit rather than the dark side. And when I mean that, I'm just going to say, what about women? Okay, because obviously this podcast is, I like to know a lot more about women um, and what we can do in regards to it. So obviously I'm tiny. Yeah, I am five foot one and a fag bimp um, and I weigh 105 pounds. And um, I know, yeah, I'm really, really tiny at the minute. Um, but that is obviously, I'm three weeks out from competition so I am very very lean um, awesome. in my off season I went up to 127 pounds so it's quite a big difference in that regard now one of my major issues that I had was that I didn't really have a lot of problem putting on muscle mass I have a problem in retaining muscle when I diet down mm. so in regards to that kind of thing that's obviously very very different from what you guys um, were talking about previously but what about your opinions on women in the industry 
wanting to use some kind of cycle or some kind of drugs. And we're talking about all women, not just bodybuilding women, but um, like bikini competitors, because I've heard of them using a lot of drugs these days. Um, yeah. So yeah, what, what's, what's your opinion on those? That's, um, it's, it's, tough. Uh, it's tough to generalize. Just because everyone, everyone's body's so different, I've seen I've seen bikini competitors on nothing at all and look phenomenal, get lean, no problem, retain muscle, no no worries. Uh, and I've seen I've seen bikini competitors on more drugs than I than 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 some guys that I train, you know. And and they need it. Unfortunately, it's it's sad to say, but if they want to compete, it's like their bodies don't respond well to training. Their bodies don't respond well to diet. But man, when you put that that super fuel in, all of a sudden it changes everything. You know, unfortunately, that that's just kind of how it is. I've seen it. I've seen it both ways. It's really fifty fifty. Um, I know that you 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 know you're you're a tiny 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 lady, and you're, <laughs> you know I, I've I've worked with a lot of natty ectos too, and they all they all the all they all have the same problem. Whether you're female or male, uh, if you're a natural ectomorph and uh, you're a natty. Uh, boy, retaining that lean tissue is, is very, very tough to do. Um, and it's we've, got to, we've got to use cardio, though, don't you? So because you have to use cardio to get that deficit out, I found that um, I was actually told today that I've managed to retain uh, the size in my upper body, but my lower body, I seem to have lost a little bit of size in my quads, it's, which is gutting, right? Because I've just spent two years trying to build the bastards up, and the minute it comes up and I start to lose, it's like, okay, that's the first place it's going to come up. Yeah. I, I have retained my glutes, though, thank God. <laughs> oh, oh, good, thank God. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, it, it, it's tough, especially, you know, when you've been, when you're three weeks out, everything's depleted anyways, yeah. and doing cardio, you know, two hours a day or whatever, you're always in a glycogen deficit, especially in your quads and your hands, you know, those are major movers of your body, um, and, and building that glycogen back up, is is almost impossible to do without you know spilling over up top too so you know it's tough to say whether that would be actual lean tissue loss or if that's a matter of glycogen water loss altogether through I weeks was thinking the same thing you know so that's interesting. The See, i never thought about that i just thought that i was going to eat all my muscle and that's well not all my muscle obviously but but yeah. with doing all that cardio it's it's i mean i don't do two hours a day but um you know thank god jesus yeah. there's not enough podcasts in the world to get me through eight weeks of prep with two hours a day do you know what i mean yeah um, yeah but yeah, so what we so you think it could be more along the lines of um, some kind of glycogen depletion rather than muscle tissue loss? Sure, uh, yeah. Yeah. This, this is a topic that we've been talking a lot about lately because it's something that has greatly affected me. Um, that for it, I could show you pictures of four weeks out from my last contest and then the day of my last contest and my quads literally vanished in that period of time. And wow. it had always been in my mindset too that yeah, I'm losing muscle, I'm burning that muscle up, and it had to do with the cardio A, and then B, I worked a job where I was on my feet for eight to ten hours a day. So you combine those two things, and you know it's a recipe for disaster. But we were talking to um, a, a couple people, Skip Hill from one of our programs, um, yeah. Blood, Sweat, and Gear. He he was telling me if you were to take say two weeks and allow that muscle the time to fill out you know sure your upper body is going to fill out first because it's not as depleted but right. in, you know in like vj is saying there's a chance right now that if you were to try to push it too hard your upper body is probably going to spill before you could get those legs full but my here's my theory at least and this is what i'm going to do this contest season i'm going to do whatever it takes to get as lean as i possibly can and then i'm going to give myself three to four weeks to eat back up and to, to fill back out slowly, to add that food back in. And hey, if I spill a little bit, I spill a little bit, but I'm not gonna gain body fat in three to four weeks. And I am gonna be able to fill my whole body back out and be able to get my legs the size that I want. So I I, I highly agree with VJ on that one right there. That's awesome, that's quite, um, that's quite exciting really, isn't it? Rather than me thinking I've just eaten my pot away. <laughs> go out, you're like, oh my God, here, oh shit. Yeah, I'm not losing weight yeah. after all. That's so cool. Even if I have, even if I have lost muscle, I'm just going to carry on thinking, no, 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 it's okay. I'm just defeated. It's cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, even for natties, it is. It's pretty tough for for even natties to lose muscle. Like they, you, you really got to torture a natty to to lose muscle. But I mean, it, it always appears that way just because of glycogen and water, and it, it accounts for so much of fullness. You know, they start going flat, and they're like, oh my god, I'm losing muscle. No, it's not. It's not that easy, unfortunately. 
you know, you better be like foodless and starving for, you know, three months before you start dipping into your muscle stores. Unfortunately, you know, body fat's going to go first. Right. So, yeah. um, yeah, it, it, it's an interesting thing, especially with people with quicker metabolisms too. Like you probably have a pretty, pretty quick metabolism, right? Oh, my metabolism is ridiculous. Like literally ridiculous. Women hate me because I can eat so much food. Yeah. Um, Men just don't kind of believe the amount of food that I do eat until they see me eat all day and then they're like, are you eating again? Yeah, yeah, I'm eating again, but thanks for pointing yeah. that out. Um, and I eat, and then about half an hour later, I'm starving hungry. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, even, even, with, uh, even with guys or, or females like you that have a super quick metabolism, losing muscle is, uh, is still pretty, pretty tough to do even. Uh, for women especially, for whatever reason, yeah. I, I, found, I found that women – have a really tough, once muscle is acquired for a female, uh, regardless, endomorph, mesomorph, ectomorph, anything in between, they have a tough time losing that muscle they build. For guys, I don't know, I don't know if, it, if it has to do with uh, the ratio of testosterone to estrogen. The estrogens are, are anti-catabolic in some way, shape, or form. I don't know. I don't know the science. I'm not Dr. Stevenson. I don't know that information. <laughs> but, but what I, I can tell you just from personal experience of dealing with a lot of females is that you know they have a tough time losing muscle, uh, even when I try to like l have them lose some muscle. Boy, it, 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 I really, really got to torture them. Really? So that that should make you feel a little better, at least. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit. That's awesome. <laughs> I love it. Okay, cool. So um, I know that I've taken up your, your guys' time a lot, so and I really do appreciate it. So is there anything that you want to say just as a final close off to this discussion, um, for everybody who's listening? Well, I don't have anything to say specifically on this topic, but I did want to say uh, thank you, Vicky, for having us. Thank you for doing what you do. You know, like like you and I were speaking about the other day, I feel like there has been a void in podcasting, uh, in bodybuilding, specifically for females. And I think it's really awesome that you've you've picked that torch up and that you're running with it. I'm I'm super excited for you, and I'm su super excited for what you're doing. Um, we're trying to l let all everybody know, really, but especially the females, um, because I feel like uh, you know they need this information that you're putting out there, um, and it, I, I think it's really a great thing. So, and also I want to note too that you are still taller than my mom. She <laughs> is like four nine, so I believe four That's nine. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, so you still you're not the shortest person there is. Just no. to, just to make it feel a little bit better. Fabulous. What was it that your mum competed in? Was she a physique competitor? Because obviously I'm assuming that back in her day when she was bodybuilding, there was just physique or figure. Was that right? My mom didn't compete. No, my mom and oh. dad, neither of them competed. They were just into the lifestyle. And okay. uh, a lot of their friends were into the lifestyle and they did powerlifting and a couple of them did bodybuilding. But it was more about just, um, I think at the time, uh, this is like the early 80s, it was just like a really popular thing to be part of the gym and, you know, a bunch of big jacked guys with chalk all over their hands. That's, that's about all I remember of it. Right. At this back, point. back then all there was, was bodybuilding, men, yeah. women, bodybuilding. That's it. Yeah. 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 Gone are those days now where we've got to cover up men's quads because they don't train legs. <laughs> <laughs> we'll get us started on that topic. That will another hour. We'll get eaten up easy. Yeah. Oh, well, we'll have, to, we'll have to have you back on to do that one because that is something that really kind of grinds my gears a little bit. But it's not, it's not. You know, some of these guys look absolutely amazing. But but when I can out squat a dude, that's a, that's a mm -hmm. brilliant feeling. I love yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> so, VJ, have you got anything that you want to give, like a last minute bit of advice or anything like that? I, I, don't, I got to piggyback on what Scott was saying. He took the words right out of my mouth. We, we love what you're doing. We're, we're real happy that you're able, and you, not, not only is it that you're, you're a female doing this and you're gonna have a huge female following, it's, uh, that's really cool in itself, but you took things to the next podcast level, you know, where you're doing this all on video. You know what I mean? <laughs> so guys, guys like me and Scott who are, who are trolls in nature, we, you know, we, we can't hide anymore. So we're out there. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, so, have my mute button. I don't have my mute button. I can't. Yeah, I can't just hide out yeah, there. Yeah. yeah, I can't. I can't like you know put mute on, yell at the dogs. I've got one sitting <laughs> right now. You know, so that's, it. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's but, it. You can't do any kind of bad hand signals or anything. It's like yeah, VJ, I can still see you. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People, that's people, get the, people get the full picture of just how weird you know we are. So. <laughs> But uh, but now nah, just thank you for doing what you're doing. We're a huge supporters of what you're doing, and thank you for having us on. I mean, I don't, yeah, you know, I don't. At first, when you asked us, I was like, why, <laughs> <laughs> why, why would you want that? But I, I'm 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 flattered that you would 
you know, ask us that. And uh, we're happy to be here anytime you want. It's really cool of you. Thank you so much. That's yeah, amazing. And, Thank you so and, much for the kind words. I will add too that if anybody is out there and they are on the fence thinking about starting to use, you know, anabolics, that that take your time with it. That there isn't any rush. Um, you know, you 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 you've got your whole life. That that even if you do decide to make that transition, the progress you're going to make isn't going to happen overnight. It's still going to take a lot of hard work, and and in a lot of ways, you're just going to complicate things. I think that's something VJ and I have talked about a lot. That you know, it, it gets a lot more complicated once you introduce gear. Um, and, it, you know, realistically, uh, there's nothing wrong with, with making that decision and then taking another six months to research and, and think about it and figure out exactly what your plan is going to be. So even if you decide you're going to do it, just take your time with it and dial it back and focus on everything else because there are so many people that come to me and they tell me oh i've got my diet nailed you know it's dialed in my diet's dialed in dialed and, yeah. you know and it's not you know it's not even close to dialed in so realistically and, and and that's not to knock anybody because we can all always be better my diet can be better i'm a coach and i'm helping other people be better I can do better myself. You know what I mean? My training can be better. There's always something that we can always be doing to get better. So make sure that all those things are as good as they can possibly be before you even before you even physically begin any of that stuff. Yeah, great bit of advice right there as well. So just very finally then, guys, um, where can people find you? Where can they follow you? Where can they listen to your awesome podcast that you've got going? Uh, you can you can find us on uh, the Genesis. We call it the Genesis is Bodybuilding Nerds Radio. That's where it all kind of started for us. Uh, you can find that at bodybuildingnerds.com. We're on iTunes. We're all over. And then uh, Scott kind of took things to the next level and created this Im amazing brand new network, Advices Radio Network. Uh, and uh, you can find us. We're on Instagram. We're on Facebook. We're super easy to find. We'll annoy the crap out of you. I guarantee. You. <laughs> That's wicked. So what I'll do? Oh, sorry, Scott. Go on. I was just going to add that if anybody has any questions for us, you know, or they, or they wanted any or more information about any of this stuff, please feel free to reach out. You can reach me on Facebook. I'm not very good at responding to Instagram private messages, but you can try if you want. Scott McNally one. You can reach us uh, like the podcast at advicesradio.com. Also available on uh, iTunes. Uh, also available on YouTube and uh, Advices Radio Network at uh, Instagram as well as we have a Twitter, too. Did you know that, VJ? Oh, wow. I, I better start getting on Twitter, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> See, even you need a link now. <laughs> so what I'll do is I'll put all of those links and all of your socials um, underneath here for the um, followers to go and give you a follow. And then, guys, as per normal, if you have got any questions whatsoever for the guys or for myself, then please put them on the end of this podcast um, on the YouTube videos, and I'll make sure that I tag VJ and Scott in order to get back to you as soon as they possibly can. Um, but until then, it is goodbye from me, goodbye from the guys here. Um, we are bodybuilding nerds and hopefully forever will be entwined. And I will speak to you all next week. Thanks very much, guys. Yeah.